Mangani, Mangani Indigenicas. Gintam? Uh, Fiona Indigenicas. Gimigwechwigo, N.A. Gimigwechwigo, Kinagoya, I.L.I. We want to thank everyone that asked us to be here. We know that we have a short amount of time, and what we'll try to do is share what we have learned over her entire lifetime, and actually I would say about a decade before that, in trying to work with our language, which is Anishinaabemwin, which is the language of the Great Lakes. I'm assuming that amongst this group I don't need to spend too much time introducing things about the language in particular or about the project of saving languages. What we really want to do is talk a little bit about the challenges that we found, and then we just have a, a range of examples that we'll share as potential ways to deal with some of them. So first, we wanted to start with a little song, right? Now, watch that up. Part of why we wanted to share that, and I'm giving you little excerpts, there's ways to make each of these parts longer, but we just want to share the different things that are important to us. And as I'll mention later, we actually moved from having language tables and a lot of classroom-focused activities in our community to working together to make our own drums and have a drum group. And that was one of the ways where Actually, we sing words that we have to ha understand the meaning to, and we actually have to learn the conjugations. That one is one that um, connects to this site, which a number of people maybe know. It has aunties and grandmas um, from our area who work together to save the water. So the way that I would always introduce our language to people is we say, look at the Great Lakes and go about 600 miles around the Great Lakes, and that's our area. That's what we would call Nishnabe Aking, and for us, one of our greatest concerns is to save the water. And when I'm trying to save my language, if I can connect it to our other primary concern and form of sustenance, saving the water and caring for our mothers and supporting our grandmothers, that's a way that we make sense of that. Do you want to hand those things out? You can. Um, so, just to really quickly give you guys some background. I know there's a number of people in here that I know, and uh, the people that I work with, we've always, we're up to all kinds of things. So I'm going to zip through a bunch of websites here, and all of them we can send out later, or you can find more, but actually on the handout that Fiona, and Donna's Fiona, is in cause of, uh, she's handing out the, the handouts that have our website on the bottom. So that would connect you back to all these things if you wanted to see them. So this site, Nongoye Anishinaabemjik, is a site that brings together two different perspectives. It's run by those of us who are members of about five different Anishinaabe nations. Some of us are Odawa, Potawatomi, or Ojibwe, Chippewa. Um, my band is Lake Superior, Minnesota, Chippewa. But we know that we all speak the same language. So we worked together to create a site that would help us connect. Uh, we all, many of us are teachers, and I teach at the University of Michigan, so this site really brings those two worlds together. Uh, some of the students that I get are students who had language from even, you know, early, early years as babies. They've been going to language camps with their parents, doing their best with their family, but they've never really had any formal instruction. Sometimes we have students who have been in instruction up to sixth grade, and then I get them again, and they're in their 20s, and they say, I forgot so much. But it's interesting now for us to see how much they're putting back together. So this is one thing that we have that in some ways shapes the landscape of what we can do. Um, then the other thing that you can see is we connect it to Facebook. So we have a Facebook site where it's a much more dynamic way to connect. We have about 3,000 people that are learning our language, using our language. It's a real mix. Sometimes I get people on there who say, I just realized that 
All of my life, my adoption papers in Detroit said Indian baby, and now I know which reserve I'm from, and they're just starting on their journey of learning and connecting. Sometimes I have uh, messages from elders from maybe a community far north, and they say they don't have anyone to talk to, so they'll log on and leave messages to see how good my students are. Occasionally we'll see people at the start of our class, uh, in class, will sometimes go on Facebook and post something in the language, and we'll see if by the end of the hour someone has replied. And, and they do, often. So our students in the university setting start to see that what they're doing matters to a lot of people in a very wide world. And those of us who are, you know, when I'm not teaching and I'm just living in the community or my own kids are on Facebook, I can say, no, get on the Nongwa site. What are you doing on your other page? You know? So it's, it's trying to be where we know people are. We have a lot of people who do use Facebook, and for us, it was a way they could post things. So far, most recently, the things that for us get really big hits um, this maybe doesn't mean as much down here, but we posted a picture of Jordan Nolan when he brought the Stanley Cup back to his reserve, and that was huge. We had people commenting on that. We also have a lot of people who comment when um, we have things that are for children. So that's, that's a part of it, where we kept asking our kids, what do we do? For me, I would try to use it at home, and any way that they were moving away from it, I would just try and bring the language into that. So that's another thing just to let you know um, kind of who we are and, and what we do. In our, just to give you some sense, I like the way Ophelia had explained, um, in my family, my parents did not speak the language. They uh, had a generation before them who had gone to boarding schools. They heard it but didn't speak it, and they told me all through the American Indian Movement, you should learn it, you have to really focus on it. So I heard it a lot as a child. I would um, go to ceremonies and events, but I, I did not become at, at all a proficient speaker until I studied it much later. And then I went to the University of Minnesota and got a Ph.D. in linguistics because that is something that's really useful for you when you're trying to learn it. But then Fiona, who's wandering around with the handouts, when you try to teach little kids, it's a whole new ball game all over again. So some of the things that we'll show you are things that we did to pull kids in. And that's what I, I want to focus on this presentation. Um, I've given some dry linguistics presentations, and there are times where, you know, just talking about our curriculum and our linguistics at a real high level is important. But then there's also how the heck do you get your kids who are watching TV and doing everything else to do the language. So I want to make sure we share those with you. Um, and some of the ways that um, we get in, that we do that, we have a language conference every year that's in, um, we usually move back and forth between Sioux, Ontario and Sioux, U.S. It's been in the U.S. for a little while. But we have very family-friendly uh, language conferences and gatherings. And I think many different nations are doing some of that. So one of ours is this Anishinaabe Muntek, and it has about 3,000 attendees, and it's very family-friendly. It, both of my girls have been going since they were, well, so I think probably one. They maybe missed their first year, but they, uh, they've both grown up at the conference. And when we host this conference, we really know that we have to build in space for the parents to talk together about what are kids learning? How are you teaching them in the kitchen? How are you helping connect the elders and get them visits and get them talking? So this is another thing that we had. Um, and then there's just the sense about what our language is. So for me, around my house, when I'm talking to her, and I'll try to say as much as I can in the language at all times, but never to the point that it's frustrating for her. Um, and one of the biggest things is teaching her who we are. So we would say, I would say Nishnabe Indao, uh, Nishnabe Moya, uh, Fiona, Nitta, Nishnabe Mot, Fishketanj, uh, she'll speak her language when she can. And when we were in Minnesota, I would have people say, no, you're Chippewa, you're not going to understand those Odawas over there, don't bother. Or those, those people are Potawatomi, you're not going to understand them. And what we learned so here's a site a friend of mine runs on the White Earth Reserve in northern Minnesota. And he talks about Anishinaabemoda. Let's all speak our language. And then there's a camp that we attend every year in Michigan, Anishinaabemda. 
And so for us, it was really important to take our kids to places that they would hear the language the way the elders perceive it, um, which was a little bit I was following up about our last talk, where there's a way that the linguists, and I say it in by being in both worlds, I know as a linguist there are times where I need to describe my language in the sense that it will connect with research, that it will connect with other ways that linguists might think about our language and our documents. But then I also need to make sure that we are connecting ourselves. If in Minnesota the elders say Anishinaabe Moda, let's all speak the language, and in Michigan they say Anishinaabe Moda, we want to make sure that our kids know that connection. Um, I tried really hard when they got cell phones to say they could only text in the language, and I still text them a lot in the language. Um, they're pretty used to knowing they have to text back sometimes. One of the most delightful things was that this last summer, I noticed that you know, you've got friends from Wisconsin, Lackview Desert, they were at the language camp texting each other. And this was maybe six or seven months ago, we were on our way to Albuquerque, she was texting one of her friends from Lackview Desert. So I have to sometimes just realize that I need to teach them the phrases they want to use. What you doing? Where are you going? Are you in school? Those simple phrases that I know kids in Michigan use, kids in Wisconsin use, kids in Minnesota, because they're the next generation for our language. We were pretty impressed, though, that Diné Land is, is about the size of all our, our space if we could squish it together. For us, one challenge of our history is making those connections. Um, what? Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's another good point. So she says she'll add things in, and you guys should ask questions if you have them. Another thing that I had to notice when we use the language at home is that she's going to use it her way. So she'll sometimes play jokes in the language that if I were some real hardcore corrective teacher, I would stop. But, in fact, it's, it's her language. What she's going to do with it is what she's going to do with it. So you know how when you text, you say, I love you, somebody might answer and say, I love you too, and they put the number. I was texting her and I said, Gazag in, and then what would you say back? Gazagin nij, and nij means two. It means it is as a number, though, not in like gazagin gae. So we, I had to realize, just you know, not to correct myself. There's also, if you guys have ever heard um, young people say whatever, you know, we've heard that. And then I would hear her and her sister or her friends say, what was, how did that one go? You remember, you guys were using it one afternoon, you said, when ash, which for us is what in our language, but she picked up the English intonation. So there's times where I really want her to know a song and the precise words because we'll end up somewhere where that oral background and the precision that the elders might want us to have is important. But there's also a lot of times where when you're using it at home, you've got to let go and let them do what they want to do with it. Um, so then what was the next one? Let's see. Come click on this next one, see. So the other thing that, just to give you some sense of the context we work in, the Ojibwe People's Dictionary, it still is, it's labeled Ojibwe, but again, we all look at it as Anishinaabemwin, and this is an interactive dictionary that's really powerful. There's a lot of information for us. So this is one of those examples where we, as people, at, you know, in homes, if the girls are doing something, she has an older sister, if they're doing something and they don't know exactly the word, they can go online and look things up. So part of me teaching them is teaching them how to find a word when I'm not there. But then it does come back to, can you just play a game of cards all in the language? Which we, we try to do those things as often as we can. There's another dictionary. For us, I think we're maybe even an over-documented language. The trick is getting people to use what's out there. So there's another dictionary that um, I've used with them. And sometimes at home we'll talk uh, in English about how the words work and how things can be complicated. And so this is, if you just look up rabbits, there's so many different ways to think about rabbits and use those words. So sometimes we'll start with a place um, that is maybe online or so, a piece of conversation, and then we'll go back to, okay, so now what stories can we use? And if we really want to have fun, what we did one day... Um, yeah, so, gi uh, we made a brown bunny. Brown bunny came to the conference, <laughs> there's Zawabus. 
So Zawabus became a way that we would just use the language. So, you know, Apish Zawabus, where is Zawabus? Ankach, Chigaming, Jinkare, Michigan. Chizagagan, Wenesh, Namazagagan, Neguigan. We could talk about all kinds of things. We created ways to have a doll that she made just have a name that we refer to it always in the language. When we're talking about Zawabus, we, we take pictures of Zawabus or text them back and forth, save them. I use some of them in class. Zawabus Gija Chinle Jinagwa. This is Zawabus at yesterday at Chinle. And, and what was fun, oh, you got to go back to that. Let's do we bump it. Gainjidana. <laughs> so when Zawabus uh, was in Chinle, uh, the elder that was out there with us, he said, what is that? And so we got into a little conversation, but we ended sharing what we knew about teaching kids the language. He shared with us how they used that plant, Zawabus, uh, Waskoneng. And, and we talked a lot about colors, directions, what grows now in the canyon, how we're saving our language. And so when we can find little tiny tools, now I don't think I'm ever, I'm ever going to get a grant for making felt rabbits. I don't know, maybe I could. But that felt rabbit has been one of my most powerful teaching tools. Um, so those are some of the little things that we use, that we pull together. Um, and, we, and I'll be around, you know, we can talk more about that. But one of the things we've had to recognize recently was it's almost as important to teach people how to use all these different resources and stay out of the arguments about which is the best one. I mean, I don't really care which dictionary they use. They need to know that a dictionary only gets you so far. You've got to really go talk to your elders and try using it in a sentence. Um, so, they saying you can't hear me. Um, and so what we try to do is make sure that we teach students and children how to use it at home and use the resources that are around there. The other thing that when I reflected on what I have found over the years the most difficult in teaching, there were three things that came to mind, and if I can save anybody the time learning these, I'd be happy to do it. I think one is one that we all know, just basically the community support. We all know that you get yourself in situations where you may not have the funding, or the tribal council doesn't want to do it, or you're doing something that really isn't part of your job and the only way to get it done is to do it through overtime. So that balance of how do we get support and people aware, aware of our issues, that's a challenge and I think other people have talked a lot about that. ILI is really good at connecting people on that. The connections to sustainable ideas, that's something that I haven't heard people talk about as much, but recently I hear a little more. So the fact that we sing in our drum group about water, about well-being, about health and happiness, those are actually pretty important. The fact that we made sure everybody knew how to make their drums, oops, and the day that we did them, we were speaking in the language as we made the drums. So we had the elders on hand that could teach us that tradition, but also the language to bring those things together. Because when we leave those separate, if we're just trying to do the language at a language table, which was kind of how I first learned it myself, it just didn't work. I mean, I honestly swear to you all that I got a whole PhD and still felt I don't know what I need to know. And I didn't have anyone on my committee who was going to check if I knew a dirty joke or would know the, the prayer set at a funeral. I didn't have anybody that was really checking if my proficiency was where it should be. I had to go out and find that in the community go back to my relatives and make sure I had that side. So we really try to connect that if we can. Um, and then the, the last one is about energy. And that one I don't want to come across as kind of crazy. I know my linguist friends would say I was crazy for even bringing this up. But I personally have seen so many people in language work encounter really negative energy and not talk about it. And we would have this all the time. I mean, you all know when you've got a language table or a group and it's going well and you have somebody new come in and maybe they bring the dynamic right back to day one or something happens with the dynamic that's really hard to deal with. And if we aren't um, able to talk about the importance of having really good energy around this work, it gets so hard. I have um, elders that went to boarding school 
And some of these elders that I work with, their approach to learning is very much the way that they learned in boarding school, which was not the kindest, most happy and friendly approach. And they will sometimes be really corrective to students and they will say or do things that I know might hurt the students' feelings because I remember when they did it to me and it hurt my feelings. And for many years, I was afraid to say anything to them. So maybe now I'm just getting old. Or when I see, actually, I think it could be that when I saw it start happening to my daughters, we would practice at home and we would sometimes have people come over who, when she would say something, they would jump all over it and try and tell her to say it a different way. And we got to the point where we finally made a rule that there can only be really good energy around all of it. And we really try to reiterate that because if you don't have that, it is the single biggest thing that will drag it all down. So whenever we can do things that are fun, that may appear more like play, um, that involve art, that make important connections, we try to do those because it's that negative energy and that sort of fear and competitive sense of guilt and inadequacy that I think keeps a lot of people from being as proficient as they could. So the other thing, do you want to say who is this? Do you want to talk? Sometimes, I don't like putting her on the spot if she wants to chip in. Um, so that if you go to, I think it's down here. No, where's your four colors one here? Go here. No, all right, try just that. Just here. You do it. Okay, I'll try to do it. There you go. Okay, so this is another one. This is someone who was in our language table for a long time. Um, and do you want to do you want to talk about who this is? This little creature. This so there's a bear, and in Ojibwe it's called Makwa. Let's see, it has a little name tag. And a little bear would be Makunt instead of Makwa. Can you hear? So and part of this is that to just not forget when you're doing complicated curriculum to make some part of it fun. To remember to like do books that will appeal to kids. Obviously I know many of you are doing this, that are, you're connecting curriculum together. It was just an example that was compelling to me when I said to her, talk about the things we do most at home. Reading these books is one of the things that we do a lot. So it was a tool that, you know, maybe I didn't recognize how much it had impacted the way that she sees and enjoys things. Um, the other thing, this one kind of scrolls, which is, no, let me see. Okay. Um, so I think if we go here, do you want to sing them the song? Do you want to talk about this? Is okay. This what you wanted? You can leave it there. Well, because you told this is what it was before. Okay. So, now do you want to talk about the Shkakamakwe song you handed out? We'll sing that one. On the sheets that I handed out, um, it could then, you could flip it over if you don't have the song on the front page, but it's called Shkakamakwe, and it's like, kind of like, it's all, it has, it's a song about all the directions, north, east, west, and south. And on the back is a little game that she and her sister made for one of the languages, language camps. So it's just an example to show you that when we go to the kids and ask, how do you want to do it? What do you want to sing about? What do you want to learn? We end up getting things that are appealing to them. And so for us, we try to always put them on, um, on our site. So Another one they did lately was um, some board books. If you go to the colors one. So this was through the Michigan or Minnesota Department of Education. I treat all those states as all the same. I'm sure that those governors would not like that. But so show the picture of you and Josie. So this was they actually had a grant to take board books and put them in both languages. So she read them to the kids that were in our area, but actually 5,000 of them got handed out in the northern Minnesota area, and now they all have a tag on the back that says to parents, you can go to the website, so you can see up there where it says you can download a PDF in case you just want to use these words in class. You can also hear the audio, because we often run into parents who say, I'm not confident enough to teach. I don't know these words well enough to, to teach them. So we wanted to make sure that they were prepared to do those things as well. 
So do you want to sing the Shvat Kamikwe? Because this is, this is the one that is actually, I think, because it's about daughters and directions, it's probably the one that is her favorite. That's what she says anyway. And you want to try and do it? Okay. You guys can sing along, look at the words if you want to. See, actually, I guess that's the thing. I taught her to be a teacher, so you should sing along. And we know Pat Ningwants can do it, but I don't know. <laughs> so, ready? Normally we would sing it more times, but I'm trying to be conscious of your time here. So that was one where they can sing that one. I've, she actually has done it at schools. She went to a little school in our area and um, was able to teach the students there. The teacher didn't know anything about Native Studies and was just sort of teaching out of a book, and she was able to teach the kids to sing that song. So that's kind of another thing that we're trying to do is make sure that we that we teach the uh, next generation of teachers as well. So we use it at home if we can as much as possible and then we have the drum group at our house every week, every Monday and we have a number of songs that we've written all in the language so that the kids who are there have some part of the language that becomes memorized and internalized and that's where it lives for them. And then there's a lot of things that we have on the web. So there's a balance. Some things are on the web, some things aren't. Um, Oh, the, I, the, I should tell you, she says, about the, on that song, you see where it says, Shka Kamikwe, Maza Kamikwe. Um, we have so many elders that tell us different ways to do things that we thought we would honor both because we've heard elders use both of those. I actually additionally know some elders who would say, there was no Mother Earth, stop saying that. But you have to do the thing that works for you. So for us, we've been at many women's ceremonies and to have that sense of, that mother that has made things and is watching out for us is important. So we're trying always to honor the many traditions, but I hope what she takes away from all of it is what we did in our house was something that fits with us. So what she will take the next generation is going to be the things familiar to her. We're kind of running out of time, and we wanted to make sure that you guys had a chance to ask questions so um, the one other thing that I will just note is that on our site, we try to notice, of course, that kids are going to grow up and do different things on you. I think we all saw from the YouTube site where he was posting some interesting lessons per day. Um, that's what will happen. That's what your teenagers want to talk about. So we have a former student who actually did a, a piece on how to talk about suicide. She was studying the language at our house. She would come and hang out with our family and, and learn the language kind of immersion in our household. Then she went off to get a job in social services, and what she found was that she had a lot of teenagers that she needed to talk to about suicide. And one of the biggest lessons that we were trying to teach was that whole sense of be positive, love yourself first, and come from get that strength, be a centered self, not a self-centered person. So she wanted to create a lesson where she could share that. So as it moves up, as kids get older, you find that you have to stay with that. So you're always challenging wherever they're at. Um, another thing that I try to do, trying to live up to the legacy of those before me, Ophelia is a hard one to live up to. But I've had probably now, i got to say, about 50 poems published in in Anishinaabem one. And there was a time when I thought, I will never get anything published if I keep insisting on writing in, in our language. But, in, you know, things change. And so I have had poems published. And when I do get them published somewhere, I'll tell the publisher, and I had some resistance early on, like Michigan Quarterly Review said, well, you can't put it on your website. And I said, then you can't have it. Because if I publish a poem and it's in my language, I want the people that need to hear it as well as see it in print be able to hear it. So whenever I do that, I'll put it there in both languages and include the digital audio so that people can hear it. And so that students can see 
this is what you do. You can actually get an MFA, you can publish creative writing, you can have that. You know, there are many uh, native authors now and more and more are using their own language. So those are things that we've done. We try to do as much as we can at home. I think our biggest lesson we've learned is that just you have to be brave enough to remind people to stay positive at all times. And I think it's been great. There's been times where I was scared to tell some of the elders involved, oh, don't you two argue with each other. But she did it, which was, was good. Um, and, you know, I think if people have a lot of technology out there, mixing that into what you do for us to do that at home, to mix those things has been useful. Um, it may not be the thing for everybody. We just don't have a setting where they could stay with somebody full-time immersion and the other thing, I run into a lot of households where one parent isn't native, and so they're kind of learning along with the kids maybe and the parent who is. So you just have to work with everything you have. I guess that would be my one big lesson. Use every means available and stay positive about it. Um, do, you, do you have anything to add? And do people have questions? Do you have anything to add, Fiona? We, we realized we had a lot to say in a short amount of time. Do you have anything you want to add? We brought all our favorite things, our mokonts and our zawabus and the different lesson examples. Do people have questions? Well, at least none of you are snoring. If you don't, I, we have a, a little traveling song that I'll sing for you. Do um, you want to do the traveling song? We'll do that. The other thing about the drum group that I would say is that our songs became a way for me to get some of my adult learners who just would not do the verbs the right way. I don't know if you guys have this in your languages, but for us, I could get any grown-up to say miigwech or, or kawabma, but they, don't, they didn't really want to do the endings that we have, and we have so many delightful endings. What are you doing? Okay. Um, in this song, if you listen really carefully, the first verse ends as if all of us are saying goodbye to all of you. The next verse ends as if one person is saying goodbye to a large group. The next verse is if one person is saying goodbye to just another person. You hear the switches in the ending. And for, for the first time ever, I got some adult women who told me, oh, I can't ever get those down, to memorize the song because they had to show up at drum group and do the song right. A few weeks later, I see one of them in the grocery store. She says, oh, Kawab oh, Just like that. She got her endings right because she had internalized it in a different way that I think was more available to her. So for us, that other way of holding people accountable, it wasn't a quiz, but she had to come and sing together and she wanted her voice to be there. So, so we'll sing that traveling song for you. And we thank you for your attendance um, and and if you have questions, let us know. You know, miigwechki vizindawiak. Do you want to do? Ready? to say to Gimigwetchen to Fiona. I think if at her age I would have been terrified to come into this room. So Miigwech Fiona and Gimigwetch Wiggle. <laughs>